I had the pleasure of, of welcoming uh, Ahmed to, I think it was either our first or second CDX conference uh, some seven or eight years ago. Um, uh, and uh, I believe I met when you were heading up online and digital. Um, so um, you've gone all the way through CMO and now president President, um, so it's uh, it's really a thrill that we stayed in touch all these years, and uh, I do hope that we can see each other at a physical in-person conference sometime soon. But nevertheless, it's always great to have a conversation with you. So, um, so welcome. Thank you, Drew. Uh, always a pleasure to address this community. And as you said, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to both shaking hands and getting together in a room. <laughs> yes, me too. Me too. Um, so, uh, just for those who don't know you, just give us a quick uh, uh, name, rank, serial number, and a little bit of uh, your, your day in the life of uh, Ahmed Shah. Sure. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, I'm president of 1-800-Flowers. Uh, as you know, we are a, a, a eminent sort of gifting platform. And 1-800-Flowers uh, is our flagship floral brand. Uh, but we have an all-star lineup of brands, including Harry and David, Cheryl's Cookies, et cetera. So, you know, we, we want to create and lead a platform that allows people to express, connect and celebrate. So very privileged, uh, this is my 10th year uh, with the company and uh, I've played a number of sort of internal roles, uh, but really uh, excited uh, to be part of a, a customer journey that is built around sort of expression, connection and celebration. That's great. Um, and I want to jump right in, but before we sort of get into some of the questions we talked about, any 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 thoughts on what we just heard from from John from the Harris Poll? Uh, anything stick out to you? Is that's definitely something you've been seeing, or any interesting insights, or what um, what what was top of mind as John was wrapping up there and went through that, that data? I think I think for a lot of business leaders, you know, right now there is there is sort of a bunch of I would say strong momentum around sort of consumer adoption, around sort of seeing their businesses do well, stock market is doing well. But I think what John reminds us and what is actually top of my own mind is the amount of emotional and cognitive load we are going through as a society, right? Suddenly mm -hmm. half a million people uh, not with us anymore. You know, main streets in a lot of cities and, and, and counties devastated, a lot of people without jobs, so actually, you know, what stuck out to me is still, uh, you know, even though our confidence as a community is rising, uh, there's less fear. I think there's still a strong undercurrent of just enormous cognitive load and stress on part of all customers and, and employees and all of our other stakeholders that we are privileged to work with. And I think that, you know, this duality of state where there's a bunch of good news surrounding you and there is a, there is an underlying sense still of of uh, dissonance. I think that's that's what sort of stood out to me. And certainly, what John was talking about that, you know, the and we'll talk about it a little bit later. I think essentially, uh, the customer has also evolved as much as we have evolved as as sort of a society and a community. Indeed, and um, I know we're going to get to a lot of uh, topics and issues here, but I'm also curious. You guys just had what equates to your Super Bowl. Uh, you have some. Do you have some some big days throughout the year? At Flowers Valentine's Day certainly being one of them. Um, I'm also wondering what sort of top of mind as you come out of Valentine's Day. I'm sure you're still going through a lot of the data and analytics, and um, but anything uh, as it relates to the consumer and things you expected or surprised you. Um, What's the takeaway from, from one of your Super Bowl days as it relates to commerce and business for you? Yeah, and, and, and you know, generally the way we frame Valentine's Day is that, you know, Mother's Day is kind of invariant in terms of its day of the week placement. It's always the Sunday, whereas Valentine's Day moves around since it's mm -hmm. into the 14th. So generally, and 2016 was the last year, when you go from a weekday to a weekend, for example, last year from Friday to a Sunday, you generally have a double digit decrease in your overall sort of top line. So we are still pre-earning, so I won't get into that uh, sort of the outcomes, but suffice to say, we were very pleased with two things. I think uh, uh, as a society, you know, we are seeing an acceleration of engagement and expression. You know, people really want to, you know, make sure that they are acknowledging sort of the deepest relationships in our lives. Is, you know, because if you think about it, like the six feet apart physical distancing 
has actually paradoxically made us a little bit more closer together in our expression, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. you know, very happy about what we saw as continued ex acceleration of that expression. And, you know, we certainly play, a, play a, a, a significant part in that. And I would say the second thing is that, you know, what we essentially see is that the nature of competition is evolving. You know, it is no more enough to say that I'm functionally within the gifting space, I'm in e-commerce or I'm in retail and hence my set of competitors are the known known players. You know, now you have significant uh, sort of inroads being made by newer startups, by players who may be outside your functional uh, sort of competitive pool, also trying to dip into that customer because the customer has become a lot more open and a lot more uh, uh, digitally savvy than I've ever seen. <clears throat> That's great. I appreciate the backdrop of, of you know your thoughts on the consumer, and I also want to uh, segue a little bit into in, into innovation. Um, and one of the reasons that I'm always excited to talk to uh, to one eight hundred flowers is, is, in my opinion, it is is the original, if not one of the original, direct to consumer companies. DTCs are very trendy now, um, but uh, one eight hundred flowers has been out there quite a long time. But more importantly, one eight hundred flowers, going back to the one eight hundred number, which was seen as a technology technology innovation at the time, has always been on the sort of cutting edge of technology adoption and platform adoption from one eight hundred number to the web to mobile, to apps, to voice. Um, so I, I, I want to get your thoughts on, on the culture there. And, um, and, and you guys really have a history of innovation. And you know, any, any sort of advice or secret sauce in regards to um, sort of getting that going if you're not there yet as a company or keeping it going and really having that digital mindset and innovation is, is everywhere. I would say, you know, uh, it's a very uh, important uh, point that you're making, Drew. You know, we have considered always sort of uh, innovation as part of our DNA, starting from Chris and Jim, who founded the company, and really push on a daily basis, how are we innovating alongside our customers? So when we look at a culture of innovation, we really look at a culture of being customer first. And as customers adopt platforms, adopt mediums, adopt modes of content consumption, engagement, expression, we want to be alongside them and and also i think you know what it has taught us over time so as you mentioned you know we were one of the first companies on going back all the way to CompuServe, and then suddenly right. well then we launched on blackberry when i joined you know which uh, was always i laugh about it now a marker of corporate <laughs> acceptance of your trajectory you absolutely <laughs> so you know, and then over time, we have seen sort of the mediums and the platforms evolve. But one thing remains, I think, when companies think about innovation, they think about a process or a project to undertake. Whereas I think innovation is a mindset. And the reason I say that is that a lot of the internal drag coefficients that we have that pull down innovation are actually the ones that, that are never talked about when we talk about how can we be more innovative. So it's not about setting up a separate team. It's not about setting up a separate competency, but actually allowing and empowering your frontline operators to think about how can they move the dial closer to the customer. So innovation for us is a pathway to get closer to the innate expressions of the customer. And I'll give you a couple of examples of it, you know, how we think about innovation. Yeah. For example, you know, recently what we have observed is, is a fascinating rise of what I call participatory commerce. And by mm. participatory commerce, I mean, whether you take you know, Reddit forums, whether you take slick deals, providing the best vetted coupons, if you will, right? This kind of communities, I think are giving us an idea about the, the, the filters being employed by customers. We saw some in, in John's uh, sort of polls, how are they going to think about the post pandemic world? But I think this evolution that we have seen of customers branding together, I think is a very, very important uh, uh, sort of marker, if you will, right? And it's, it's a lot more deeper. If you think about the first 1.0 of social media was very light touch, you know, the number of likes your post has, the virality your post has. But what we find in participatory commerce is what kind of engagement is reciprocated by the users. 
Mm. You know, how do they ingest your product in their regular posting versus it being a paid posting and looks like a placement? Because those things, we have become much more smarter in terms of, you know, absolutely blanking out on them. So that is one way I see, you know, this participatory commerce and, and sort of innovation rising. The second way, which I think is, is really important and which is what I talked about earlier on, our competitors are no more the same set of competitors. So you had, you know, two couple of big IPOs last year, for example, DoDash, et cetera, right? Now they are facilitating, we used to be one of the predominant same day delivery uh, focus companies, right? Now you have a lot more competition, right? So how do you set that, that apart? The customer mm -hmm. expectation around delivery uh, outcomes has changed. So innovation then becomes almost your way to keep ahead of non-apparent competitors as well. So, you know, we spend a lot of time not just thinking about customer facing innovation, but how are we innovating through our supply chain, through our community right. of stakeholders, and how are we empowering them to do the same outcomes that we care about, right? So it's, it's, it's a mindset shift versus, you know, just doing functional outcomes, if you will. Right. And we had talked a little bit about that and it really comes back to ecosystems, does it not? Right. I mean, your full ecosystem is your supply chain. It's, it's your customers. It's, it's everybody. And how, you know, do, do you have thoughts on, um, okay, our supply chain relationship has just always kind of been this, but you know what, now we want to engage and innovate with our supply chain. Um, you know, any thoughts on, on sort of, you know, empowering those ecosystems on your behalf? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think that was one of the key takeaways I had from what John was talking about. Mm -hmm. I think in the future, Drew, we are going to see an innovation around, you know, safety first supply chain. Right. And, and by that, I mean, across the whole value chain of your suppliers and how they get a certain outcome to your customers, we are going to be empowering, you know, sharing data, sharing best practices, like we worked, you know, very closely. We we do a fair bit of uh, cookie and chocolate uh, production out in the Midwest. We work very closely with the local public health teams, you know, which are not traditionally seen as part of your supply chain setup scaffolding, but to provide the best in class safety for our production colleagues, right? And and in fact, it was so popular that the state you know, looked into how we can adopt some of the, the recommendations that we gave. So that is one aspect of it. The other aspect of it, I think is, you know, how do you communicate to the customers that ultimately mm. your supply chain is not just something that you're gonna wash your hands off, but it is equally a part of customer experience. So right. we have, you know, weekly letters going out by our CEO and the chairman to our entire community, not just our customers, but to every stakeholder that talks about what is weekly, sort of what are we seeing, you know, how are we celebrating these best practices? How are we celebrating engagement by our stakeholders? We have a, you know, 4,000 plus florists that are part of our BloomNet network, you know, one of the last remaining main mm. street businesses. Mm. And we have spent a lot of time educating and working closely with that community. For example, even helping them procure uh, difficult to find uh, floral and other supplies. So this is this is really, you know, when I think about us in a pandemic and a post-pandemic world, I think some of this, this hierarchies and some of this communal relationships that we have had have been, have been deeply redefined. And I think for the good, because now I think everyone understands and appreciates that we are actually a house of one versus right. a supplier and a, a consumer, et cetera. Yeah, and I would think it's even as important if not more important when your supply chain if if you know you have partners that are responsible for the last mile <laughs> or you yeah, know the actual absolutely. delivery or touching the the customer um so you know i'd be remiss to not spend a few minutes talking about marketing um and and innovation and particularly in the context of this sort of new um post-pandemic consumer that we may see so i'll ask you to to throw your cmo hat back on a little bit and you you guys have decades of experience to, oh of acquiring customers. We'll talk about retention in a second. So, you know, beyond what you would expect, people searching for flowers and search, and I'm sure you have an Instagram presence and a Facebook presence and all those things that you might expect that a company like yours would do. I'm wondering for those out there who are looking at digital growth and acquisition, 
you know, what are your thoughts moving forward? What, what are the areas that may not be so obvious? And what are the areas that you may look to invest in from a marketing standpoint, because this consumer has evolved and will continue to evolve beyond the channels that that sort of makes sense for you to invest in? You know, I have this, I have this internal framework that we spend a lot of time about, and I'll share that with you as a framing device, but we talk about the three C's and by that, I mean sort of the content, community, and then commerce. So I think yeah. what, what we have foundationally and fundamentally seen evolve in marketing is, is this idea that, that people are consuming content in a very deep manner. So for example, your diversity and inclusion uh, efforts are equally a part of the content that customers are expecting versus it being a footnote in your annual report. It is being debated. One of our most successful uh, uh, examples of this is, you know, how we created a Reddit ad, uh, this uh, holiday, which actually went pretty viral. And we said, mm -hmm. you know, a tongue in cheek, don't shot your Valentine. And it was <laughs> playing off the subreddit meme, but then it also allowed us to bring in the community. So it's not just the content pieces you are putting out, but how are you building in the community? And Reddit has this really interesting feature that people can actually comment and discuss your ad unit itself. It's a post, right? So the idea that, that you will get real-time feedback, you will get participation, you'll get people who are both sort of have a point of view, you know, maybe positive, maybe negative, mm -hmm. but we are rallying other folks around it, right? So we think this idea of, you know, having very engaging, having very real authentic content is going to become even more important. The ideas of community that that content can engage, that your company can engage are so incredibly important. I mean, if you think about the growth of communities around companies, you literally have people who have gone through deep understanding of what the company does, what the customers should expect. And they're putting forth a point of view, which is now getting rallied around by people around them. So I think that's a very important outcome. And a combination of these two is also how you, how you market your commerce stack. And that, uh, what I've seen the evolution as that, that everyone wants to be digital now, but the, the baseline of what is considered acceptable by the customer has gone up tremendously. Right. So, you know, like every year I joke that, you know, this has to be the year of mobile. Because finally, <laughs> you know, some sites won't make you pinch out, pinch in. But I still find, you know, that when people think about commerce, they think about it in a very homogeneous manner. Let's put up a website. Let's, let's digitally, you know, uh, uh, solidify the experience. But they are not starting from the customer experience. If a customer is on an iOS device, the expectations of your, of your menu is very different from an Android device. That's what our testing has shown. So if Absolutely. you're not going a level deeper with the customer, if you're not engaging in an authentic, real manner with your content, helping build a community, and then helping them do commerce at their own pace, own rate, and in their own device-centric mindset, you are going to miss out the ideas of marketing because marketing is not the same, same as, you know, let's be omni-channel, you know, let's go social, let's post right. more. Those things, yeah. I think, are, are, are rapidly going away. And, you know, you talk a lot about, um, you know, data for obvious reasons. You're very metrics oriented and, and understandably so. Um, let's, let's dig into data a little bit and, and I'll get to the tension sort of there at the end. Um, you guys are awash in data. You have tons of great first party data. Obviously, you have data potentially from your partners, whether it's search metrics, things like that. Um, you had talked about a learning stack. Uh, sort of when talking about data. Um, and we talk about MarTech stacks, we talk about tech stacks more broadly. Um, but you know, talk to us about how you approach data um, you know, in terms of your own sort of data stack there and your philosophical approach to data uh, and, and using it and, and sifting through it and ensuring that it's valuable and then, um, and, and then applying that uh, moving forward from a marketing standpoint, whether it is for reinvestment of marketing dollars or on the retention side. Yeah, I, I find this fascinating because I probably get asked this uh, as one of the more uh, important topics. I think, you know, my philosophical point is something uh, I read recently and modified it a little bit, but, you know, biology does not code for 
uh, uh, data, it codes for fit. Right. You know, so evolutionary outcomes are always more tighter when you are closer to having a fit versus having a lot of data. Right. So yeah. our position always has been that, look, customers give us data, especially in a gifting context. You can imagine it's not just the data graph, but sort of their recipient graph, how close they are, etc. We take that responsibility extremely seriously because we think that when customers share data to us, they are asking us to be good stewards of what fit can we provide to them? You know, right. what outcome can we provide to them? You know, not, not the fact that we are massive collectors of data, we sit on it, expose the data, et cetera, which a lot of other companies, you know, are not thoughtful about it, right? So we start with the idea that this is a real responsibility and we have to be stewards of that data. And ultimately evolutionary outcomes with our customers are going to code for how good we are at using, using that data. So that is one point, right? The second evolution that we see actually is that concomitant with customers giving us more data, there is actually increasing data darkness that surrounds us. Mm -hmm. and not just from wall gardens putting up data, but I also think, and look, I'm a consumer myself, I think some of the changes going on at the browser level, at the device level, are at least encouraging the conversations we need to have as a society. Right? Is, is sort of background collection okay, whether it helps an advertiser or not? And, and I think we are a little bit away from the answers, but we still start with this mindset that, look, if we are good stewards, people will always give us good first party data. And if we use it better, so we have a great reminders program, for example, which reminds you if you know your wife's birthday is coming up or brother's birthday is coming up or anniversary coming up, and the way we utilize the data is very thoughtful. So for example, if you came and gave us some data around sympathy, you know, that is off limits. The yeah. data is accessible, right. the data is, is, is very well structured, but we, we make a moral judgment. We make a, a larger judgment about that, that hey, you know, that is an episodic ephemeral point of data. And even if it is a, a, a thoughtful data, that is not something that we want to use because we understand the sensitivities involved when you share that. So I think, I think this, this uh, conversation around data has to move from the idea of what we think about data as just binary sets of numbers and traceability of the customer to a much more healthier understanding of what does it mean for us? What's the North Star guiding when we think mm. about data and suddenly then everything else that goes with it, people, process and technology. Right. Um, so in our last couple of minutes here, I'd be remiss to, you know, given your history as a technology innovator, uh, I'd be remiss to not ask what technologies, the uh, emerging platforms, emerging tech is top of mind for you. I know you guys um, were out there with one of the first voice apps. So I'm just curious about voice and whether you've seen sort of this increased usage from your from your customers. I know artificial intelligence, which is a little more back of house is something you've used a lot. Uh, I don't know, I saw a question just come through on sort of Bitcoin, but are, are you thinking about people being able to pay in Bitcoin? But what, what emerging tech and platforms are on, on your radar? I would say two, you know, the, starting with what I said about participatory commerce, I think uh, artificial intelligence technologies, both on the content consumption side on our website. So we work with mm -hmm. a great uh, uh, software company out of Silicon Valley called Abacus. Um, yeah. that is helping us crack a lot of this AI mindset. And I, I use the word mindset because I think AI sometimes is understood as a skill set outcome, but it's, it's a lot about like, how do you collect and, and ingest data? How do you empower the frontline? And actually my prediction is in the next five years, the same way when we started out Drew as analyst, we all got mm -hmm. the Microsoft suite and our course in Excel you know, even two, three years down the line, every employee starting out will get an AI bot, which will help them get through that daily task at a much faster rate. So not just in customer outcomes, we are devoting some time to understanding what will accelerate employee productivity using AI. So that is one. And then the mm -hmm. second one, which, I, which has fascinated me for the last three or four months, even though I'm late to what I call the ice bucket challenge on voice, <laughs> but I'm fascinated by Clubhouse because of two things. I think voice recall sans any of the, the mm, you know, open yeah. windows, you know, monkey dancing on the screen, et cetera, right. has an extremely strong potency to it. And mm. secondly, I think at scale, it is the most emerging open medium 
I've seen in the last 10 years after you know Facebook uh, emerged with such ferocity. So we are keeping a very close eye on that. And, and finally, because I do have to go, but uh, any quick thoughts on best practices around retention moving forward? I know you, when we had our prep call, you were talking about, yes, yeah, sometimes we're sending emails just to check in and say hello. Um, you know, not necessarily trying to sell anybody anything, but, you know, what are your best practices for retention as it relates to, you know, longtime customers and the new customers and particularly this new consumer that we're, we're going to see say, evolve? I would say, Drew, very quickly, it all stems from how empowered your customer experience function is, because mm -hmm. the way we think about, uh, about sort of segmenting customers is what quality and quantum of customer experience is most meaningful to them. And then everything flows from that in terms of retention. And I would say, you know, the starting point, I would tell everyone in the audience, and I certainly do, I spend an hour every week listening to our 1-800 calls, whether on customer service size or ordering size, listen to your customers. They are, at, they are, they are sharing with you more than they have ever done. And they are mm. actually really enthusiastic about what they have to say. Right. No, that's great. Uh, Ahmed, I could always talk to you for an hour. Um, and and I, I definitely look forward to the time when we can get you back on stage in person at one of our events and I can see you and we can have a drink and, and talk about all of this in person. But uh, thanks as always. Um, stay well. And I do hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Great. Thanks again.